Okay, welcome everybody. This is uh, Chapter 5, dealing with the integumentary system, and we're going to start with an overview. Skin is approximately 15% of an individual's total body weight, making it the largest organ in the body. More than just an outer covering, it's a complex organ with many functions important for homeostasis. It's known as a cutaneous membrane and has two main components, the epidermis, which is the superficial layer consisting of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium resting on a basement membrane. Now, again, when you see words, break them down. Okay, keratinized means that it contains large amounts of the protein keratin, which provides toughness and tensile strength and also has a little bit of a waterproofing capability. Stratified means that the tissue is made up of more than one cell layer. Squamous means that the epithelial cells are flat like a pancake. And epithelium means that it's either a covering or a secretory tissue. Okay, In this case, we're talking about skin. We're talking about a protective covering. The dermis lies underneath the epidermis. And again, look at the words, right? Epi means above or upon and dermis means dermis, so the epidermis lies on top of the dermis, which is deep to it. It is uh, composed of connective tissue, both loose and dense irregular connective tissue, and also contains a basement membrane. Remember that the basement membrane is made up of extracellular components that are secreted both by the epithelial layer and by the connective tissue layer underneath it, and it serves as a way to seal the overlying epidermis to the underlying dermis. Accessory structures embedded in the cutaneous membrane include sweat and sebaceous glands, hair, and nails. Okay? Another name for a sweat gland is a sudiferous gland. So let's write that down so that we don't forget it. Sweat gland, also known as sudiferous gland. S-U-D-I-F-E-R-O-U-S, sudiferous. The skin contains sensory receptors and erector pili muscles, which are bands of smooth muscle associated with the hair that allow it to become erect in the event of a stressful situation, a frightening situation, or a drop in temperature. The drop in temperature causes the hair to stand erect in order to create a layer of dead air between the skin and the outside environment. It helps to hold in body heat. Um, in the uh, event of a frightful situation, the hair standing up on end really goes back to when we were covered head to foot in long hair, and when the hair would stand straight up, it would make us look larger than we were. If you want to see an example of this, um, go home tonight and frighten a cat. The epidermis is avascular, so it has to rely on diffusion to get oxygen and nutrients from blood vessels in the deep dermis. And this is another example of the gradient core principle, which limits epidermal thickness. 50% of the cells in the epidermis are too far from the blood supply to live. The superficial layers are made up entirely of dead cells, again, due to lack of nutrients and oxygen. But, as we're going to find out, this is by design. Okay. This aids in the protective function of the skin because the upper layers get shed and replaced very quickly, and this cuts down on the possibility of infection. The hypodermis, which is beneath the dermis, is also known as the superficial fascia or subcutaneous fat deep to the dermis. Although it not, is not officially part of the skin, it does anchor the skin to deeper structures like muscle and bone, and is made up of loose connective and adipose tissue and has an abundant blood supply. Okay, so you can see here that the hypodermis is highly vascularized. Um, you may have heard the term hypodermis or hypodermic in reference to a needle. Okay, hypodermic needle injects stuff under the dermis into the blood supply so that the drug can make its way to the other tissues. The integumentary system has the following functions that are critical for protecting underlying organs or for maintaining homeostasis. Protection from mechanical trauma, pathogens, and the environment is an obvious function. The stratified squamous keratinized epithelium is a durable but flexible surface 
and protects the body from mechanical trauma like stretching, pressure, or abrasion. It provides a continuous bar barrier to invasion from microbes or pathogens that can cause disease and contains cells of the immune system that destroy pathogens before they invade deeper tissues. And those are primarily found in the dermis. Glands secrete a variety of antimicrobial substances. The sebaceous gland, for instance, generates secretions that give the skin a slightly acidic pH known as the acid mantle that inhibits pathogenic growth and it provides protection from a number of environmental hazards including ultraviolet radiation before it can damage deeper tissues. The response to this okay, is to produce melanin. Okay, So the idea here is that melanocytes which are found in the epidermis melanocytes generate melanin that gets distributed to the other epithelial cells giving the skin a brown color and protecting from UV radiation. UV radiation is dangerous because it's a form of energy this energy can break covalent bonds in DNA and that can alter DNA structure leading to mutations that could produce cancer cells. The skin secretes a hydrophobic lipid based chemical array that repels ionic and polar covalent molecules like salt and water and this is critical for maintaining water and electrolyte homeostasis in a wide variety of weather conditions. Now while it's true that we do lose moisture through the skin okay this happens as a result of sweat. Okay, the sudiferous glands manage this. They generate the sweat as a filtrate of blood, but the fluid from our body doesn't just go directly through the skin. And as a result, the body has some control over the activity of the sweat glands and thus can use that as one of the ways that we control body fluid content. It's also a sensory organ. It's a process that enables the nervous system to perceive changes in the body's internal and external surroundings and is critical for homeostasis. The skin has sensory receptors or cellular structures that detect changes in internal and external environments. Receptors allow us to detect potentially harmful stimuli like heat, cold, and pain that could lead to tissue damage. It's also important in thermoregulation. This is a process that relies on negative feedback loops for the maintenance of a stable internal temperature. An example of the feedback loop core principle is thermoregulation. Internal body temperature is determined mostly by muscle activity and chemical reactions involved in metabolism. A sequence of events that occur when body temperature rises above normal may be caused by extremes of weather or abnormal conditions that cause fever. Sensory receptors in the skin detect an increase in temperature in both the skin itself and the internal body fluids. The control center in the hypothalamus of the brain acts as a thermostat and receives input from the thermoreceptors and processes and responds to these inputs. The control center stimulates sweating. The sweat glands are stimulated to release a watery fluid called sweat. The water carries a great deal of heat with it when it evaporates and provides for an effective cooling mechanism. The control center stimulates cutaneous vasodilation. This is a response triggered by the hypothalamus causing blood vessels in the dermis to vasodilate. They widen. Okay, This increases blood flow to the dermis. The dilated vessels increase the amount of heat radiated away from the body into the environment and this also helps to cool the body. We should also point out that the sweating as it dries cools the skin which cools the blood which cools the body. The body temperature then returns back to the normal range and the cooling mechanisms decline by negative feedback when thermoreceptors no longer sense the body temperature being above the normal range they stop sending signals to the hypothalamus and this ends the control center response sweating and vasodilation thus end. We should also point out that the Sweat has an antibacterial component to it. It washes pathogens from the skin, but it also creates an environment that tends to inhibit um, pathogenic reproduction as a result of an acid pH 
Okay, um, so all of these things together uh, act as a barrier, a physical barrier, against the penetration by pathogens. So here you can see an example of this feedback loop operating. Okay, there's the initial stimulus, the body temperature increasing above normal. Um, the result is the receptor relays this information back to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then sends commands to the effectors. The blood vessels vasodilate. The sweat glands increase the sweat production. That cools the skin, which cools the blood, which cools the body. And then we're able now to reduce the activity of the blood vessels, reduce the vasodilation, re reduce the amount of sweat produced, thus negative feedback um, oscillates around this particular set point. Now, um, this will go on and on uh, with the body temperature going up and down and up and down around a set point. Again, remembering that homeostasis doesn't mean that it, these, these internally measurable characteristics of the body, these physiological variables, are, are static. It, it just means that they stay within a certain range. Okay, what happens on the flip side? When the body temperature drops below normal because of a cold environment, thermoreceptors detect the change in body temperature below normal and relay this information to the hypothalamus, which generates a different response than for a high body temperature. The blood vessels in the dermis narrow. This is called vasoconstriction. And this reduces the amount of blood flow to the skin and limits heat that gets lost to the environment. Vasoconstriction redirects blood flow to deeper tissues to conserve heat and also to keep the internal organs operating. When body temperature rises back to normal range, the thermoreceptors stop sending the information to the hypothalamus. The response is that the hypothalamus that the response that the hypothalamus generated for heat conservation will end and the feedback loop will close. And again, as we can see in the diagram, this this will repeat, this will oscillate around a set point as long as we're in the cold environment, right? The stimulus causes the receptors to trigger afferent information to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then sends the commands to the efferents. Those are the blood vessels. We reroute the blood to the core, and the result is that the body temperature goes up. Now, we should also point out that there are other responses that are going on at the same time to help generate body heat. One of them is called shivering thermogenesis, so we can put another arrow here, okay, and write down shivering thermogenesis. And this is the conversion of chemical potential energy to heat energy, okay, by causing you to shiver, and the result is the same that also feeds into elevating the body temperature back to the normal range and then the feedback loop will close off. Another important function of the integumentary system is excretion. This is a process where waste products and toxins are eliminated from the body. Most occurs at other organs like the kidneys. The skin and its accessory structures make a small but significant contribution. The skin plays a critical role in vitamin D synthesis. Cells found in the epidermis convert vitamin D from an inactive to an active form. Precursor is modified cholesterol molecules. They're converted to cholecalciferol when the epidermis is exposed to UV radiation. This is then released into the blood and modified by the liver, then the kidneys to form calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D that promotes mineralization of bone. The vitamin D is required for calcium ion absorption from the small intestine. Calcium ion is critical for nerve function, muscle contraction, building and maintaining bone tissue, and other physiological functions. We should also point out critical for blood clotting. Okay, so again we have to take all that stuff into account. Now, um, our first topic um, with regard to the anatomy of the skin is the epidermis. So we're going to proceed from the superficial to the deep layers of the skin and talk about the processes that go on in each of these histological layers. The epidermis, as the name implies, 
lies on top of the dermis and it's composed of several cell types the most numerous being keratinocytes it makes up 95 percent of the epidermis they have two structural features that make the epidermis stronger and less susceptible to trauma they manufacture keratin which as we already pointed out is a tough fibrous protein that makes the epidermis resistant to mechanical trauma again generating um, or, or pointing out the linkage between structure and function and it's linked together by desmosomes and this makes the epidermis stronger. Remember that desmosomes are a form of tight junction that provide mechanical strength, allows substances that want to penetrate the skin to only have to go through the skin cells themselves. They can't go between the cells because of the presence of these tight junctions. Okay, So forms a barrier but also holds the epithelial cells together. Keratinocytes are organized from deep to superficial into five structurally distinct layers. The stratum basale, which is sometimes referred to as the stratum germinativum, is an adult stem cell layer that rests on top of the basement membrane closest to the cells that supply blood in the dermis, just on top of what we call the papillary layer of the dermis. Therefore, most metabolically and mitotically active cells in the epidermis are found in this layer. It's involved in vitamin D synthesis and the replacement of the overlying layers of tissue, which die as they move away from the blood supply. The spinosum is the thickest layer and sits on top of the basale, so it's still relatively close to the blood supply. It is metabolically and mitotically active, although we should point out that the reason that this this layer gets this name, spinosum, okay, is because the cells are taking on a spiny appearance, okay, spiny appearance. Okay, they're spiny. And the reason for this is that the cells are beginning to die. They're not dead, but they're beginning to die. The, the volume of the cytoplasm is, is becoming reduced and the cytoskeletal elements are essentially um, becoming more pronounced under the surface of the cell membrane, hence the appearance in this layer. The stratum granulosum is approximately five layers of cells with prominent cytoplasmic granules that are filled with keratin bundles or a lipid-based substance um, which adds to the waterproofing capability of the epidermis. Okay? Um, sometimes refer to this as keratohyalin. The hydrophobic nature of the lipids provides waterproofing and is critical for the maintenance of internal fluid and electrolyte homeostasis and also leads to the isolation and death of cells in this layer and in more superficial layers, again by cutting off the diffusion of nutrients and oxygen. The stratum lucidium is a narrow layer of clear dead keratinocytes found only in thick skin such as on the palms or the soles. The corneum is the outermost layer of the epidermis made up of layers of dead flattened keratinocytes with a thickened plasma membrane filled mostly with keratin bundles. It's sloughed off or exfoliated mechanically as desmosomes holding the neighboring cells together are lost. And what this does is this cuts down on the potential for infection because it essentially cuts the ground out from underneath pathogens before they get a chance to set up. They're shed off into the environment and as a result don't represent a threat. This is in addition to the protective function of the secretions of the sudiferous and the sebaceous glands okay, and the protective function of the underlying layers of the epidermis as well as the dermis. There's a simple trick to remembering the strata of the epidermis. Brilliant studying gives loads of confidence. If you get confused as to which stratum is superficial and which is deep, think of B in basale as standing for bottom and that is the bottom layer. Okay, So it goes basale, spinosum, granulosum, lucidium, Cordia, okay. Remember to point out the fact that in some types of skin, the lucidium is absent. Okay, so we would shorten the mnemonic to brilliant studying gives confidence.
The keratinocyte life cycle is relatively short. The location and functions of the epidermis subjects it to physical and environmental stress. As a result, the corneum is continuously shedding dead cells that have to be replaced in order for the epidermis to continue to function. Dead keratinocytes are replaced by mitosis of cells in the basale and spinosum where the blood supply is still available for such activity. As the keratinocytes in the deeper strata divide, they push cells above them into superficial layers. The keratinocytes begin life in the stratum basale or spinosum and pass through each epidermal layer until shed from the corneum. Migration from the deepest strata to the corneum takes about 50 days to complete. Okay? So again, as soon as we lose these cells, we regenerate them. Think about this the next time you dust your house. 99% of dust is human skin. Other cells in the epidermis include dendritic cells located in the spinosum. These are phagocytes of the immune system and protect the skin and deeper tissues from pathogens. Merkel cells, which are oval and scattered throughout the basale, containing sensory receptors associated with small neurons in the dermis. They detect light touch and discriminate shapes and textures. And they're found in large numbers in regions that are specialized for touch, such as the fingertips, the lips, the base of hairs, the soles of the feet, the toes, and so on. Melanocytes are in the basale and produce melanin, which is a brown pigment that protects the skin from the damaging UV rays of the sun. As with all structures, the form of the epidermis in various parts of the body differs to match its function, again in agreement with the structure function core principle. The palms of the hands and the soles of the feet are subjected to a great deal of mechanical stress, so these regions of the skin have adapted. Remaining regions of the skin are not subjected to stress, thus the difference in function and exposure to stress have led to a thick and a thin skin. Thick skin, which is about as thick as a paper towel, has all five epidermal layers and a very thick stratum corneum and does not have hair follicles but contains numerous sweat glands. Areas of the body not subjected to as much mechanical stress are covered with thin skin, about as thick as a sheet of printer paper, has only four layers, the stratum lucidium being absent. Each of these four layers is thinner than those found in the thick skin contains numerous hairs, sweat glands, and sebaceous glands. The callus is an additional layer of stratum corneum that forms in either thick or thin skin in response to repetitive pressure. So mechanical stress brings about a proliferation of this, this callus layer, okay, which is found primarily in the lucidium. Okay, the dermis is a highly vascular layer deep to the epidermis. It provides blood supply for the epidermis. It contains sensory receptors. It anchors the epidermis in place and is composed of two distinct layers made up of two types of connective tissue. The papillary layer, again the name means something, right? A papilla is a finger-like projection, so the papillary layer contains finger-like projections that intrude into the epidermis. It's the thinner superficial layer of the dermis made up of loose connective tissue. Collagen fibers are found in this layer at the dermis epidermis junction and extend into the epidermal basement membrane to anchor the epidermis to the dermis. Dermal papillae are tiny projections found at the surface of the papillary layer where it comes into contact with the epidermis. It contains tiny blood vessels called capillaries that are arranged in loops and extend up into the most superficial part of the dermal papillae. And this allows oxygen and nutrients to diffuse into the extracellular fluid of the dermis, then into cells of the avascular epidermis. Meissner corpuscles, also found in the dermal papillae, are sensory receptors that respond to light touch stimuli, are more numerous in regions of the body where sensation is a primary function, again, such as in the skin of the fingertips, the toes, the lips, the face, and the external genitalia. Okay, now the reticular layer lies beneath the papillary layer. 
It's a deep, thicker layer that separates the dermis from the hypodermis. It's mostly dense, irregular connective tissue that consists of irregularly arranged collagen bundles, which strengthen the dermis and prevent traumatic injury from damaging deeper tissue. Elastic fibers let the dermis return to its original shape and size after stretching. It's also rich in proteoglycans that draw water into the ground substance and keep the skin firm and hydrated. Lamellated corpuscles are embedded within the reticular layer. These are sensory receptors that respond to changes in pressure and vibration associated with the skin. Blood vessels, sweat glands, hairs, sebaceous glands, and adipose are also found in the reticular layer. Okay, keep, keep in mind though that their origin is um, for the sweat glands and the sebaceous glands is epidermal tissue. It's just that they are, they are intrusions into the reticular layer. And so what you're looking at here is just a picture of the dermis. Okay, you can see again the papillary layer here, the finger-like projections that intrude into the epidermis. Above them is basal lamina, and then above that are going to be the stratum basale that generate the epidermal tissue. And then you can also see here the tactile corpuscles, again, designed for our sense of touch. And you can also pick up the lamellated corpuscles for vibration deeper in the dermis. Um, they also uh, are designed to detect deep pressure, okay? And that's a result primarily of their position. These are some skin markings. You probably know these better as fingerprints. These are small visible lines in the epidermis created by the interaction between the dermis and epidermis. They're best seen in the thick skin of the palmar surfaces of the hands and fingers and the plantar surface of the fingers and toes. Dermal ridges are found in areas where dermal papillae are more prominent due to pressure of thick collagen bundles. The dermal ridges indent overlying epidermis to create epidermal ridges that enhance the gripping ability of the hands and the feet. The epidermal ridges occur in characteristic patterns such as loops, arches, and whorls. These are genetically determined and unique to each person. Sweat pores open along these ridges and leave a thin film or fingerprint on things that we touch with our fingers. Okay, so you can see an example of these dermal ridges here, okay, generating these epidermal ridges, and here you can see the pullback view with the fingerprint. The reticular layer is also responsible for skin markings associated with tension or lines. Cleavage lines and flexure lines are gaps found between collagen bundles in the dermis. They create indentations in the epidermis called tension or cleavage lines. In areas of the body, such as this, those areas surrounding joints, the reticular layer is tightly anchored to deeper structures that create deep creases called flexure lines. Okay, and so you can see examples of these different lines. Now, one of the things that we'll notice is that um, these arrangement of collagen fibers in the dermis make what we call a, uh, a series of cleavage lines if you're performing surgery, you don't want to cut perpendicular to the cleavage lines. You want to cut parallel to them in order to not generate abnormally large amounts of scar tissue upon healing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about pigmentation. Skin color is determined by various amounts of orange, red, to black protein pigment known as melanin. It's produced by melanocytes in the stratum basale of the epidermis and made of two molecules of amino acid called tyrosine, chemically bound by a series of reactions catalyzed by the enzyme tyrosinase. Reactions occur in a stepwise fashion within a special vesicle called a melanosome. The protecting keratin it protects keratinocyte DNA from mutations that are induced by UV radiation. The melanocytes have several extensions of plasma membrane that are in contact with the keratinocytes of the basale and the spinosum. The melanosomes migrate to the ends of these arms where they're released by exocytosis and absorbed or taken into the cytoplasm of the surrounding keratinocytes. The melanin is then transported to the superficial side of the nucleus that faces the body's exterior and this shields the DNA of the keratinocyte like an umbrella. 
The melanin has to be made continuously to maintain a consistent skin color as it degrades after a few days. So bottom line is that with regard to melanin, everybody has the same number of melocytes approximately, but it's the amount of melanin produced and the distribution of the melanin that gives us our characteristic skin color. Okay. Melanin synthesis increases with exposure to natural or artificial UV, and this leads to tanning or darkening of the skin. UV radiation has both an immediate and a delayed effect on skin pigmentation. The immediate response is oxidation of the melanin already present in the keratinocytes, causing them to quickly darken. It also causes DNA damage in melanocytes, stimulating melanin production and leading to delayed secondary effects of UV exposure within 72 hours, which lasts longer than the initial melanin oxidation. The amount of UV radiation melanin can absorb is limited, as is the protection that it provides. People of all skin pigmentations can develop sunburns and are at risk for skin cancer. Remember,